with his brother um, building these cairns. Now cairns you would use um, to sort of put next to a grave for instance or you may use it to build what looks like a, a memorial building as well um, and you usually well you can do it out of stones as you can see with the image on the right there now if you think about a grave it could be sort of foreboding that he is going to die if, if he carries on into that plane and goes with his mission um, or it's just a, sort of a way to think of memory that it's used for a memorial and here we have a memory happening right now um, this image of being with his brother as well makes you think that he wants to be back with his family. And if we focus particularly on um, this whole part, you've got hardly any punctuation. Now, why? Why has this been deliberately done? Well, maybe to show that he hasn't got time to think, to breathe, to stop. And that's the power that the memory has over him, the power of memory, the power of place has on you that you don't get to stop and think what you're doing. Um, if we look at also the cairns, the pale grey pebbles that have been used for it, pale grey, those adjectives there are very calming colours, much like earlier on we had the blue, green, translucent sea and garland. We use colours to show how possibly he is wanting to escape the violent panic in that plane. He's been drawn to images and colours that are peaceful and quite tranquil, and that's what he wants out of that plane. Now, these boys, they've built the cairns so that they can see whose is best at um, dealing with the violent inrush of the sea as they wait for the, their father next to it. And it's that word turbulent. Who's withstood longest the turbulent inrush of the, of the waves coming in? Now, turbulent could reflect the, the pace of the plane, um, how turbulent the plane journey is. Certainly, I feel that in planes. I've got massive phobia of them. It's quite a foreboding word as well. And it really is juxtaposed with that final word, safe, turbulent and safe. Now, turbulent, how he feels panicked in the plane, but he wants to be safe. And he remembers his father's boat coming back in safe. And he thinks, well, I want to do that as well. I'd like to be back with my children. And ending the stanza with that word really makes you really think how he wants to end this to be safe. It's the main thing in his mind. Uh, the crown will come to you in a minute, you'll understand why. Right, yes, grandfather's boat, safe to the shore, salt sod in a wash with cloud mark, mackerel, black crabs, feathery prawns, the loose silver of white bait, and once a tuna, the dark prince, muscular, dangerous. Um, I'm really apologetic for this, but yes, grandfather's boat, safe, should be in italics. And, well, that's important because the italics show you that we've got a shift um, before you had simply third person narration, but now we've got this person, this daughter speaking. We know that she's speaking to her children. That's that little pop part there you've got. Yes, it was grandfather's boat, the boat that came in before. Garland deliberately uses all these adjectives. Let's have a little look at them. Cloud marked, feathery, silver, white bait as well. well that, that's not quite an adjective there at all but cloud mark feathery silver all of them if you think of it are quite light things clouds feathers silver white and they all carry this same togetherness of light imagery and you think of light imagery it's, it's images that are light and happy and bright it's maybe how he is seeing the light he is thinking of light, happy, positive things because he wants to go back to it. He's being drawn back to happiness and away from his mission. He's remembering his father's normal routine of being on a fishing boat, and that brings him happiness. It's encouraging him to want to go back home. Notice I said before about the word safe ending the last stanza. Well, it now ends the line of the second um, following one. Now, why is that important? Well, he's repeating that end word of safe. Like he is actually convincing himself. It's on his mind now. He wants to go home. He wants to make sure that he is safe for his children like his father was safe for him when they came back off the fishing boat. That idea, again, of conflict, um, the opposing ideas of war going against family. What should he go with? Should he fight or should he go back to his family? Now, there's a very important line. If you're going to remember quotations for each of the poems, you should maybe remember at least three um, per quotation, uh, per poem, sorry. So I think this one at the end, a tuna, the dark prince, muscular, dangerous. Now, in particular, if you remember anything, for me, it's remembering pictures, drawings. I'm a terrible drawer in my year 11 class, will know that, but it does help with revision. So if you drew a tuna with a crown on top of it, hey, you can remember dark prince. And why should you remember it? Well, you should remember it because this poem is showing you, like I said already, that the power of nature. Dark prince. Now, 
a prince. It's a metaphor. It's saying that the tuna is a prince. Now, that's very regal. That's uh, very powerful and sort of comical at the same thing. But why? Why is this tuna got a pivotal, huge role in the poem? Well, it's showing you that maybe we should worship it. Worship it like you'd worship a prince in a sense. But it goes against the word dark. It's quite frightening. It shows that the tuna had this frightening power over the boy. He remembers um, as a boy that the tuna being pulled out of his father's fishing boat and it was dark, a dark prince. It's also muscular, dangerous. Why have just one word? It's a bit like in Prelude when he sees um, the huge black peak and he's using basic words. We've just got one word for this. It's just muscular, dangerous, like he's almost astonished so we can't get big, ambitious um, phrases out when he sees the fish. Again, power of nature, making man look really small compared to nature. Oh, lovely little gift there for you. And though he came back, my mother never spoke again. So this is the first person part of the poem. You need to be clear that this poem has third and first. So the first person being the, the daughter speaking to her children. And though he came back, my mother never spoke again. So he did. He never completed his mission. He came home. And when he did, his mother, the mo her mother never spoke to him again. His wife never spoke to him again. In his presence, nor did she meet his eyes. And the neighbours too. They treated him as though he no longer existed. And we children still chatted and laughed. Now, he, his, you've got third person pronouns. Really, I think that they distance herself from her father. And the shame that she had that he didn't do it. I told you about the Japanese honour. He had to complete suicide to, to get that honour for it. And notice, it wasn't just the mum that didn't look him in the eye, the neighbours too, they were completely embarrassed by him. But what's important about this is, nor did she meet his eyes, the neighbours too. It goes on to the next line, and jamblement of it, it shows how far the embarrassment went. It, it spills into the next set of people, just like it spills into the next line, it spilt into the neighbours as well. It was ongoing, it was non-stop. I think it's really embarrassing and upsetting and traumatizing that it says he no longer existed. It's very powerful. It shows how powerful that Japanese culture has had. It's actually made him be removed from his own family. But the only people who actually still respected him, well, didn't understand it, I'd say, were the children. Because the children, when she was a child, the mum, she still chattered and laughed. Those verbs are very happy, um, like she, they carried on. And what's Garland maybe saying about this? Why bother adding about the children? Maybe to show that the children are the right people in this. They're, they were innocent and how we shouldn't really be like adults. And normally children, they see everything in a happier light. And it could be a message against war that we shouldn't be fighting. Okay, we're nearly there. You're nearly done with my voice now. So the last one, till gradually we too learned to be silent, to live as though he had never returned that this was no longer the father we loved. And sometimes, she said, he must have wondered which had been the better way to die. Now this punctuation used very purposefully there. Um, you've got a lot of commas and two full stops. Strange, because earlier on in the poem we had barely any. And um, please remember that the barely any punctuation was used at times when nature was powerful over him, so he couldn't stop, and when the memory was powerful over him. So. The children, like I showed you before, they were chattering and laughing, but then gradually they learned to be embarrassed of him too. That verb learn shows that it was a behavior that, that was inherent in them. It was learnt into them. They had to, because of their culture and their family, be forced to reject their own father. Not because they wanted to, but because they had to, the power of culture over them. To be silent. And the comma is used straight after it. It literally follows the silence to make the silence. Is there a pause maybe here to just show that? Or is it that she stops as she tells her children this and she feels maybe a bit of guilt kicking in? And there's also that full stop after that this was no longer the father we loved. Like she stopped loving him. That's why the full stop has to be there. And you've got that past tense verb, loved. She, it's quite saddening. She had to forget him and not love him anymore. She doesn't still love him, it seems, because it's still in the past tense. And sometimes, comma, she said, comma, those commas again, is she pausing because it's upsetting her? He must have wondered which had been the better way to die. Now, when she's telling her children this, and you think, wow, why is she telling her children all this? Um, she's telling them that, well, he, he must have regretted it, but also thought, I should have just died. That's the 
really the most emotive things I think out of this poem, the last line. It really shows that it never stopped for him. The ongoing conflict carried on and on. Um, it was probably better if he just died in that plane and come home to a family who'd considered him dead in the end anyway. I think I'm going to leave uh, sort of the last bit for you to think about was, I can't just tell you everything, you do need to have a personal response to the poem. Why a full stop? Not every poem has to have a full stop at the end. Um, you'll notice in checking out my history, there isn't one. And you might want to comment on why. Why, when this poem had a lot of lack of punctuation at important times, why did she decide to have a full stop at the end? Is it to stop it? Is it because everything, the love for the father stopped? Is it because his life stopped when he came home? It had to stop because he'd lost all of his honour and respect. Okay, so thank you very much if you managed to get through two parts.